Hello everybody, this is Iced Blood. Welcome back to Final Fantasy XIV. Today is another dungeon video. We are going to the Tamterra Deepcroft today. Oh, sorry. Spoilers. Um, yeah, we're moving on with the story and that means our second dungeon. So we're just going to jump right in. Uh, we're going to talk to... The guy whose name I can never remember, no matter how many times I see it. And he's going to send us off to the Black Shroud for our next dungeon. So... Badaren. Badaren! Bataron. Pretty dear about that job, then. Like I said, the request comes from our sister guild in Gridania. That's all I know. But whatever it is you get asked to do, I somehow doubt it'd pose any trouble for adventurers to survive the Bedlam and Sestasha. If you think you might be interested, you want to have words with Mother Meun, my counterpart in Gridania. Good luck, mate. Alrighty then, off we go. So, we are going to... talk to... Skane Rail. Oh, these names. I've I've talked about these names before. I will keep talking about them throughout the series, I'm sure. I cannot pronounce half of these. All right. Uh, and we're going to talk to the Lenoflo. And we're going to Grenadia. I still wonder about the safety of these sh ships here. Like there's no containment there's there, there's there are rails sure but I mean look how small Elyon is he could fall through those rails like what good are the what good are they for then what's the the safety precautions there do I have any seat belts I mean what happens if it like hits turbulence what if uh, uh, I don't know what if a dragon shows up and then we have to be all uh, we have to maneuver all carefully or, or well anyway anyway I don't even know what I'm talking about I guess if we maneuvered carefully, everything would be fine. What if we had to maneuver very quickly, and it wasn't careful, and then I could fall out, and then what? I don't have feather fall. This isn't d and This just seems really dangerous. But we made it, so never mind. Ah, uh, the glory of cutscenes. I don't have to worry about my safety. Uh, anyway, we're in Gridania. Alright, so we're going to talk to Mother Mion. Mion? Mayan. And talk to the Mayans! Uh, there she is. Aha! Take a seat wherever you like, friend. Our waitress will come to take your... Oh? Not here to dine? Dare I hope that you're the adventurer, Badaren said word about? You are! The matron be praised! Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Mion. And the Carlin Canopy is my place. With regard to the task in question, there is a fair bit to tell. Let me know when you're ready to hear the details, and I shall brief you. Yay! Alright, uh... Oh, okay, we didn't even have to pick. We got both. Alright. Uh, do I need to... No. No, I don't. That's right, we did it at the end of last episode. We don't need to do that. Alright, let's just get right into it. What do we got? Ooh. Anything I can use? Uh, well, I guess I'm taking the bronze pieces. Because my current gloves are better than those. Alright. We're ready for that briefing. Good. Now then, here's the long and short of it. I beg pardons for interrupting me on, but our need grows over more, ever more pressing. Have none stepped forward? And good day to you too, Bolord. Your need must be pressing indeed for you to honor us with a visit. The good news is your journey hasn't been wasted. I'm pleased to report that we have a volunteer at last, and one who comes highly recommended at that. My thanks for answering the call, friend. My name is Lewin, and I lead the men and women of the God's Quiver. Now... Time is of the essence, so I shall proceed directly to the heart of the matter. 
We wish for you to nip a potential threat to Gridania in the bud. Beneath the central shroud, there lies an underground burial site called the Tamtara Decroft. The place was once a Gamoran settlement, but we Gridanians have long interred our dead there. Of late, however, shadowy figures have been seen skulking about the Decroft, and with ever-increasing regularity. Based on the accounts of various witnesses, we suspect that these individuals belong to the Lambs of Dalimud, a doomsday cult which sprung up prior to the Calamity. These zealots have proven themselves dangerous in the past, and we leave them to their own devices at our peril. Ordinarily, I would have dispatched my best men to scour the Deepcroft with orders to flush the cultists out. Alas, the Calamity decimated our ranks, and the limited forces at my disposal are constantly required to keep the Ixal at bay. Bird men have grown restless of late, and I fear a storm may be brewing. In anticipation of this, I have been compelled to spread our forces throughout the Twelveswood, lest we be taken unawares. The situation so being, we must turn to others to deal with the Lambs of Delamud. Can we rely on you to undertake this task, friend? You have my gratitude. Once you have seen to your preparations, pray make your way to the Deep Croft, and identify yourself to the guard posted at the entrance. He will apprise you of the latest developments. That is all. Be careful out there, you hear? May the crystal guide you and keep you. Okay, a little more serious. Now we're not dealing with pirates and fishmen. We're dealing with cultists and the undead. Perfect for me. I love dealing with the undead. Uh, what's this one? Oh, that's for the... Aesthetician. Aesthetician? Aesthetician? Was that character's name Farrell and Manson? That's cute. I mean, not cute in the cute way, cute in the subtly condescending, I don't know, whatever. So, we're back in the forest and now we have to kill the undead. I love zombies and skeletons and ghouls and various other things. I'm not sure how fond I am of cultists, but, well, uh, anyway, I suppose we'll manage. Uh, let's see. I'm going to put you over there. Just in case. We probably won't need much in the way of healing. We'll have a healer in the dungeon itself. And these first few dungeons are very simple. This is the introduction to group content. This is not going to stress, you know, your skills as a player. Uh, if it does, well, the whole point is that it's relatively simple to get into it to get involved, and, you know, it's not going to be one of those things where if you make one mistake, then you're dead. You'll be, we'll be fine. We will be fine. Considering Elyon's guild, being a thaumaturge, is set in a freaking cemetery, the ossuary, by which I mean, I'm pretty sure this is going to be... He's going to feel right at home, is basically what I'm getting to. And, uh... It's probably something that really needs to kind of go into his character, which I was talking about last time, and I'll probably go into a little bit more this time, because, honestly, there, there's not much... Aside from the actual, like, surroundings and the way that the... Um, the setting kind of influences things. You're not going to get much in the way of story in the dungeon itself. Aside from, you know, maybe a brief handful of seconds for a cutscene uh, before a boss. Things like that. So, I need something to talk about while we're in these uh, dungeons here. I am not a tactician. I'm not going to be able to, you know, dig deep into what it means to be a good... Uh, dungeon crawler in this game. I'm pretty new at that, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, I think I may have mentioned early in the series, 
I have been in a raiding guild for World of Warcraft, but it was a very short stint, uh, maybe a handful of months before I stopped, and that was years ago. So my experience regarding like high-level dungeon uh, content is limited at best. So I'm just kind of going along and hoping that... Uh, Hoping that things stay simple enough that I won't make an idiot out of myself is basically what I'm getting at, so... Yeah, instead of trying to go through a play-by-play -play of exactly what I'm doing in this particular situation, I'm probably just gonna go a little bit deeper into who I view Elyon uh, to be. Anyway, okay. So, yes, yes, I'm helping you out, friend. Uh, no doubt the Bow Lord has already informed you. But your task is to enter the Deepcroft and purge it of the lambs of Dalamod. In case you're unfamiliar with them, the cult emerged shortly before the Calamity put an end to the Sixth Astral Era. The cultists took the Lesser Moon Dalamud for their god, believing that it would deliver them from the devastation. And so they were rather disappointed when Dalamud exploded into a thousand flaming pieces before it could complete its descent. Now, having seen their god turn to ash, one would think that the cultists might feel moved to question their faith. On the contrary, it served only to stoke the flames of their fanaticism. The lambs of Dalamud are convinced that heretics, that is to say everyone but them, interfered with the coming of their lord and savior, and that it's now their sacred duty to avenge him. Whatever it is they're doing in the deep crop, you may be sure that no good will come of it. For the sake of Gridania and Eorzea at large, put an end to their madness. All right, there we go. Tam Terra Deepcroft is now in our duty finder, so let's take a look. Duty finder, Tam Terra Deepcroft. Here we go. Whoops. All right. So, since its establishment during the Omoran times, this subterranean crypt has been used for etc. etc. Apparently, I wasn't planning this quite as properly as I'd hoped. Alright. It's fine. I'm sure we'll figure things out. So, I'll see you in a minute. Ho oh, ho, here we are! I did some traveling. Um, <laughs> off camera, I was doing a couple things shopping and repairing and getting things set up. But,. Thanks to the magic of editing, you didn't have to see the half an hour that I spent waiting for the dungeon to start. So here we go. We are in a dark and twisted crypt. Tamtara Deepcroft. Hmm, pardon me. Alright, here we are. So what do we have this time? We have me, we have a gladiator, looks like, we have a conjurer, and we have, looks like a pugilist. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Pugilist pugilist, pugilist, whatever. They hit things. They hit things with their fists. So, uh, the leader of this particular dungeon is using the numbers to mark all of our enemies from the start. So again, like I was saying, it's always good. Uh, this is one thing I do know regarding dungeon content. It's good to use those as a cue for what to hit. So, you know, always follow the leader's lead. Because chances are they know what they're doing. And if you're new to the content like I kind of am, then best to follow the lead of the group. Uh, if it turns out that they have no idea what they're doing, well, then you're all pretty much in the same situation and hope for the best. Uh, these places are not that hard, though, like I've said before. So, even if you have no idea what's going on, chances are it'll still work out okay. So, I mean, this is... You've got four players in a thing like this, and even if, you know, people don't know what they're doing or where they're going or how things work, chances are you're still going to be able to figure it out. Uh, there isn't... There aren't going to be situations that are so complex and tricky that uh, the slightest mistake will kill everyone. So, yeah. Everything should be fine. And I just realized that our tank is dressed like lightning. Hello, lightning! 
That was uh, an event, I believe, that uh, took place uh, earlier on when Lightning Returns, the third uh, of the Final Fantasy XIII series, the second spin-off, came out. There was an event where the main character of uh, 13, uh, Lightning Farron, showed up in Aorzea and you got to fight alongside of her. And if you did everything that the event had to offer, you got her costume. Or I think if you were a male character, you could get the costume of uh, um, Snow, her brother-in-law? I'm not entirely sure what the legality of calling, you know, your sister's fiancé anything in particular. But anyway, uh, unfortunately, during the time that that event was going on, I was not heavy into the game. Otherwise, I might... Well, actually, with this account, it wouldn't have mattered. But uh, it would have been really cool, I think, for Elion to have Snow's costume, considering Snow is my favorite character from that franchise. But no use crying over lost costumes. I'm sure there will be a chance to get something else that's awesome. Um, the the uh, wow um, nostalgia fail. The gold saucer came out recently, so there's that. And by recently, I mean like several months ago at this point. Um, that was a big thing, and I'm probably going to be covering at least a little bit about that uh, later on in the series. But I definitely want to jump into that. Uh, my favorite card game showed up in there, Triple Triad, and there's costumes and other things, you know, vanity pieces you can get, mounts and things like that. So, like, there's a lot of content in there. Um, and I'm sure, at the very least, I'll be able to cover a little bit of it. Um, but a lot of it, it seems to me based on my admittedly limited experience with the, you know, Triple Triad and Chocobo Racing and other things like that. It... Ooh, sweet! I got a level. Uh, okay. Um, based on that, a lot of it seems to be very grindy. So it's not something that I would necessarily want to record because I'm sure it wouldn't be all that entertaining. It might be different if it was like a, a, a live stream or something, but I'm not uh, yet into that so much. I don't really think I have the equipment for that to really work. Um, but it's a possibility. Eventually, mayhap. Alright, so let's see. We have Treasure Coffer and somebody got Ether. Okay, no big deal. Nothing all that big. And, ooh, boss time. Okay, so let's go to the one. So, I was going to say, uh, I was going to talk about... Um, a bit more about Elion as a character uh, because that seems to be my uh, go-to uh, topic when dealing with dungeons. I think one of the bigger things that kind of works itself out in my mind regarding how he works because I talked about last time how he's a absent-minded type. He's a scholar, uh, an inventor, an explorer, things like that. And it doesn't necessarily jive with the idea that he is quite obviously a gifted fighter. I say quite obviously in the sense of the narrative. Not necessarily showcasing my skill at the game. I'm not saying that I'm all that amazing. However, in the context of the story, he is quite gifted. So, how does that work? How do you get this, like, ADHD kid who barely manages to focus on anything at a given time. And trust me, I'm not making fun of ADHD, and if I'm giving off that uh, particular vibe, I am sorry. That is not what I'm trying to do. Basically, I'm just saying he has the attention span of a hyper goldfish, and it doesn't necessarily make much sense for him to be uh, a fighter in that particular context, because you'd think somebody like that would probably have a proclivity toward running <laughs> in a uh, um, combat situation. So how does it work? In Elion's case. Well, here's my theory. I'm pretty sure he basically has two personalities. Basically what I'm saying is he's he's pretty good at compartmentalizing. So when the situation calls for it, such as in a case like this, where we're in a dungeon or we've been given a critical mission by someone who really needs something done. Okay, so this God's Quiver. Uh, they need this situation with the cult dealt with. And Elion, being who he is, I think he's a very, um, I think he has a lot of empathy. I think he has a lot, uh, I think he cares a lot for people. I think he doesn't want anybody to be hurt. And I'm pretty sure 
for as gifted a fighter as he is, he is very, like, anti-fighting. As a rule. He prefers to learn. Now, granted, that would mean learning to fight would be something he'd be interested in. Which would explain how he might, you know, become a pugilist or a gladiator. Or one of the melee classes. Like, he, he would like to learn, but I think he'd be one of those people that would take from a combat discipline like that uh, a lot of the other aspects. Not so much the combat part. More the discipline. And the, the, the bodily control and things like that. Um, I think that's what he would take from a combat discipline. However, all this aside... When people need help, when the situation calls for violence, because in a situation like we've got here in Eorzea where it's war-torn and there's a lot of crazed uh, animals and various other creatures uh, that tend to be rather dangerous, I think he is able to turn on the fighter in him. I think, I, I, visually speaking, I like it to think that he keeps a pair of like glasses on him. And you think that he'd wear glasses to study, right? Because that's the cliche. But I think Elion takes that cliche and flips it on its head. When he puts his glasses on, the little spectacles, I'm picturing the little wire-rimmed ones that we picked up a while back but are no longer using because um, they're not all that good anymore. I, I, I think he takes those glasses, he puts them on, and when those glasses turn on, he's in serious mode. He's in combat mode. And so that's the visual cue that other people would get. Uh, to show, okay, now is not the time to joke around with this guy. Because if he gets mad uh, in this mode, he's liable to set us on fire. So that's the kind of a, a, a bigger part to the character for me that explains how he could both be a devoted, dedicated scholar and a rather devastating fighter. Is he has two modes. Combat mode and information mode, I guess, is is basically what I'm going for. And um, I think that's important for um, to to basically in a situation that I've got here with with a character in a game. Like I remember when I was still playing World of Warcraft rather heavily, my main character was very much. I guess I would call him an environmentalist. He was a druid, uh, real big on the natural world and maintaining the natural balance. Now, there's a lot of quests in World of Warcraft that involve basically spitting all over that. Um, you know, a whole bunch of things involving uh, you know, civilization and cities and various other things. Basically defacing nature, ruining nature, uh, hurting nature, anything like that. And I would take those quests because, hey, I'm getting experience, I'm getting gold, I'm getting a bunch of other things, I'm getting new loot. All that kind of stuff comes from these quests, so I'll just take them. Well, that kind of flies in the face of the character that I've built up. And part of the idea of an RPG for me is to literally take that acronym or and, and, and work it in. It's role play. There's a role to play. My role is as a, a as an environmentalist, as a you know, a, as a, cr a child of nature. So, strictly speaking, I should not take those quests. If I wanted to be true to my character, then I would not take those quests. However, I never quite managed to work that out. In this game, however, it's a lot easier. Because I think Elion is a much simpler person. And conversely, be because he's simpler, he actually turns out to be a little bit more complex, uh, paradoxically speaking. Because... He is simpler in his criteria when it comes to accepting a mission. He becomes more complex in his motives. So, how is it that he could be, say, a pacifist, but still fight things? Well, he's not strictly a pacifist. He just doesn't like to fight that much. If he has to, he will murder you. But he doesn't want to. And chances are he won't, unless he's forced. And this is the kind of situation where he would be forced. You're dealing with a doomsday cult. It's raising the dead. It's desecrating the dead. And I think that's an important thing for Elion, is, the, is the, the state of the dead. Right? I think that's something that he, that he holds very dear. Because he's learned how to harness his gifts through a group of scholars that work out of, a, uh, out of what looks like a, a medieval-ish 
morgue, almost. They're like a funeral home. And I think, like, he, he probably takes that to heart. As much as he can. This is to say, I really hope, for example, that there is never a class that's added to the game that lets you, like, raise the dead, like a necromancer type, right? Because I would really want to do that, because necromancy's awesome. You know, like, aesthetically. I, I love the idea of necromancers. But I don't think Elyon would, would pursue that kind of discipline. I think that's where he'd draw the line. So, yeah, cross your fingers that that doesn't happen. Because chances are then I would be in the same situation I was with my World of Warcraft character. Where, okay, the person I've built up in my head wouldn't do this. But I, as a person, as a player, really want to do it. So, unfortunately, I'm going to have to betray the character that I've built in order to have more fun. Which I'd be okay with, but it would still leave a bad taste in my mouth, largely speaking. So, anyway. All that aside. I think that kind of... Well, this is kind of a glimpse into the process that I have with a lot of games like this. And not only games, but stories and, and, and any kind of storytelling medium. This is kind of what I do in general. This is what makes games like this and stories like this fun to me is figuring out motive. Now, we don't get much of one in the context of the game itself. There's not much of a motive anywhere in our own characters. Regardless of the, you know, the, the type of character you build, the story itself doesn't give you much to run with. Out of necessity. Because the, the whole point of the game is to follow this quest line. If you don't follow this quest line, well, then things are going to get rather difficult for you. Because a major path to leveling up your character and progressing involves this main scenario. And according to this main scenario, you have to go into all these dungeons and you have to do all these things for the various city-states. So, there's not much agency in your character in general. However, a big part of the fun for me is figuring out motive anyway. I may not have much of a cue from the game itself why Elyon is bothering to help the government. You know, why is he helping the government? Why would he trust these people? Because a lot of stories nowadays involve mistrusting the, the, the bigger, you know, the powers that be. And, and in Ulda, it kind of makes a lot of sense when you consider that the source of power in that city-state is actually basically the Mafia. So, like, how efficacious is the Sultanate if this syndicate, you know, this group of merchant princes, basically, these obviously corrupt merchant princes, if they're actually in power, why do we trust the Sultanate? Why do we trust the Flames? Why can we, how can we trust um, Nanamo and General Rabon if they're not the ones in power? It's hard to. Like, even if there's a perfectly reasonable uh, explanation as to why they can't to take control from the Syndicate, the simple fact remains that they haven't. And so the question that becomes, okay, who can we trust? But be that as it may, the storyline has us doing jobs for the Sultan. At least in this case, because we're starting in Uldah. We're doing things on behalf of the Flame General, who is acting on behalf of the Sultana. So, regardless of whether or not Elyon would trust the government, he is very clearly working for them. So again, like I was saying, we don't have much agency here. It doesn't matter what kind of character we're building, we have to go through this storyline. So the fun part there, at least again, for me, is to figure out the puzzle pieces anyway. To work within the confines of what we're given and figure out how to tweak things along. So like for example, if Elyon were the type to mistrust the Sultanate because they haven't taken control of their city back from the black market dealers. Or whatever you want to call the Syndicate. Then maybe he's the type to want to fix things from within. So he wants to gain the backing of the Sultanate, gain the trust of the Immortal Flames. And then, when that's happened, he will strike himself. He will strike on his own. He will do things. He will be the agent for change. 
Now, I'm not sure if the storyline lets us do that. Um, I don't know how much further this goes. I've, I've been through a couple more of the dungeons after these ones that are right here in the beginning. But I don't actually know where it goes from there. And for the most part, I've kept away from spoilers. Uh, the one series that I watch that kind of covers this material skips over the cutscenes and the storyline elements. So I honestly have no idea where the old off storyline goes, how much the Syndicate is a part of it, or if that's just kind of a flavor uh, idea for the city-state itself. Oh, by the way, uh, the, the ruler, the monarch, is not actually in power. Actually, it's the, it's the, you know, money is what makes things work here. So the ones with the money are the ones in power. Which, I mean, probably is basically what it is. It's just flavor for the city-state because Odaw is based around commerce. So it would make sense. But, who knows. Part of me hopes that we will eventually be able to strike a blow at the Syndicate. Maybe regain the kind of power that the Sultana should have. Uh, in order to help her city. Because we've already seen uh, glimpses of exactly what's happening thanks to this uh, power struggle we've got going here. Because it's mentioned that there are so many refugees that have recently shown up in Old Da that we need to help. We want to help, right? That's kind of the whole idea. We're good people. We want to help the disenfranchised and the less fortunate. But we don't have a chance right now. We're, we're, we're handling, you know, more immediate physical threats rather than theological and and political threats. But we so we've well we've already seen that, you know, okay, the rich and affluent in Ulda are handling themselves pretty well. They've got banquets and big manor houses and rich clothing and all these sorts of things uh, that a, a, a society built on commerce would appreciate and value. Okay, so the highest class has all that stuff at the expense of those underneath them, uh, of the poor and the refugees and all that. So I am hoping, personally, that we get a chance to do something about that. I'm not entirely sure if we will, but I'm crossing my fingers. So for the most part, we are nearing the end of this particular dungeon. We have a couple things we need to still do. Um, but this is nearing, uh, the end. We're, we're basically at, at the end of the, um, the end of this cult mission because, well, we're badasses and we don't abide by this, this kind of behavior. But you have to wonder, like, if this cult is such that, like, nobody can handle them, like... And the only reason that they haven't been stopped yet is because of a further threat, like, from another direction, like... I don't know, it just seems interesting that it seems like these cultists don't necessarily have to be all that powerful to be a thorn in somebody's side. Maybe that's the whole point. I wonder if that's kind of a, a running theme here. Where, yeah, okay, like, these people that you're dealing with aren't all that powerful in and of themselves. It's just that resources are stretched so thin after the calamity that we really don't have any resources to do that. Which actually brings another question to mind, to me anyway. And that is, there's a lot of talk in the narrative about adventurers as a class. Like, as a type of person. You know, who are they, what are they like. And for the most part, it seems like um, a lot of the NPCs that we've dealt with a lot of the, the, the basically, the, the people of uh, the various city-states don't really trust them. We stand out. We as players stand out as an adventurer that can be trusted. But by that logic, most adventurers can't be trusted. Which, like, if they're so bad as a class of people, maybe that's why none of this stuff is getting done before we show up. Maybe the people, the, the, the adventurers that are usually around these city-states just aren't strong enough or organized enough to handle threats like this cult. To deal with things like the pirates in Sestasha. Maybe that's the whole point. We are special not because we're players, although we are, you know, and not because we're particularly gifted, but just because there aren't 
many people that have the kind of skills that would be needed to handle something like this. Ooh, uh oh, what we got? I think this is the last boss. This is the kind of stuff that we won't be able to do. Who summons me from the void to reside within this crude vessel? Oh, look! It's Purple Cthulhu. It's like a Mind Flayer from D&D &D or something. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll greet that. Alright. Galvanth the Dominator. Yeah, he's a Mind Flayer. Alright, here we go. Last boss of the dungeon. Let's see where it goes. So yeah, maybe this is the kind of creature that, you know, most adventurers can't handle just because they're not organized enough. And that's the whole idea, the whole point behind us as players being special, is that we're able to band together and handle things like this. Like, it's an interesting bit of, like, commentary where a lot of games like this will make it, will go out of their way to make the players seem, like, special. It's kind of the whole point of, uh, of games in general, I suppose, with a narrative, uh, with a social element. The whole idea is, um, and this is something I've talked about in the, uh, the short, uh, relatively short at this point, uh, World of Warcraft series that I did. Um, this is the whole point of MMORPGs in general, is the way that you engage someone in a story like this, where there are any number of people aside from your main character, the way you make it seem, the way you invest, basically, the player in the story, is by making them seem special. Now, this is generally the case in actually a lot of different stories. The whole idea is that you are playing the person or group of people who are special. They're the chosen ones. They're the ones that will really get things done. And I think that, you know, Final Fantasy XIV, with the way that its narrative cons is constructed, really does a good job of doing that. Not only in the way that the main storyline allows us to feel like we're, you know, gaining the ear of the powerful and affluent people in the uh, particular governments, you know, we're getting the attention of uh, queens and generals and things like that. So that's special enough. But the simple fact of most adventurers can't be trusted, but we're unique. We're the special ones. Like, that really adds to the idea that we as players matter in this world. We are the adventurers that are changing the world. We're the ones that will usher in a new era of prosperity for Eorzea. By dealing with shit like crazy magical mind flayers with scorpion soldiers. I don't know exactly how that works, but it seems to make sense to me, so I'm gonna go forward with that thinking. Okay, let's see. He's almost done. We want to get rid of these. Let's, let's handle that, I think. Yeah, they're not that strong. There's a bit more complexity in this boss than we've seen so far, but even so, it's not that big of a deal. This, uh, this Dominator guy, not so special. He's, he's only got, what, about a fourth of his health left? And here we go, we're back on him. You see, like I was talking about last time with the uh, leveling up, um, other combat classes, like experience you get from monsters themselves, not that special. So, hmm. Wait a second. Wait a second, how is he dead already? I thought we had... I mean, okay, I guess, uh... We did it! Yay! Yay! We... Um, okay. I'll take it. I thought he had more health left, but okay, I'll go with it. Um, alright. Uh, so let's see what else we got. Everybody's gone. Oh, hey. Those are both good for me. Excellent. Alright, well that's gonna be it for the dungeon. And we're closing in on 40 minutes on this episode, so I think we're going to... Oh yeah, I'm in Old Da again. I'm going to need to get back to Gridani to turn this quest in. Um, let's see about those. Let's put those on. Yeah, that was cool. And then... Oh, I'm going to need a new chest piece in order to put that hat on, though. Alright, well, the gloves are cool. And we can see our ring again. That's awesome. Alright, that's it for me today. Bye-bye.